So welcome everybody to this afternoon session. I think we will not lose any further time. I think we should start right away. Our first speaker will be Martin Svierlein from MIT, and he will be talking about fermions and flatland and ultra-cold feshbach molecules, fermionic feshbach molecules. One, two, three, I guess it does something. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to this workshop. Um, uh, I'll be talking about two things. I hope you uh, allow me to uh, deviate a little bit from the title. Uh, in the beginning, I will <coughs> tell you about uh, what happens with fermions in lower dimensions. And then in the second part, um, I will talk about uh, uh, these guys here. Uh, clearly, <laughs> a cartoon picture of uh, Fischbach molecules of sodium potassium. So, uh, we, we love strongly interacting fermions, right? Uh, S-wave Feshbach resonances have allowed us to tune the uh, interaction between uh, uh, spin up and spin down fermions uh, 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 to make them as strong as quantum mechanics allows. This is for a, a contact interaction that is now unitarity limited, so you get very, very strong um, interactions and very strong pairing. And that allowed us to observe S-wave fermionic superfluids. Now, um, Collins Miller, uh, people know that, um, that we have helium-3, much more exciting, P-wave, right? And uh, there the, are the, the, uh, many other forms of matter with more complicated interactions than S-wave. So uh, can we engineer Fermi gases that have more complex interactions is, is the question. And well, there is, uh, but this is a totally non-exclusive list what one could do. Um, one could just go to a P-wave Feshbach resonance, of course. But so far, this was tried, of course. Uh, the, this, this gives us a short lifetime. So we cannot stabilize these, these uh, P-wave pairs and observe wonderful P-wave superfluids. That doesn't work. Uh, we can hope to induce P-wave interactions using spin-orbit coupling. That's very promising. And I could talk a little bit about uh, um, uh, what we did in, in, in that direction, but that's not, the, uh, not my talk here, so uh, got to ask me in the coffee break. Uh, it's not obvious right now whether this would be strong enough or stable enough or anything uh, to observe interesting uh, states of matter. Now we can reduce the uh, dimensionality or mix the dimensionality if you have mixtures of ultra cold atoms. Say we, we could have um, uh, sodium in uh, 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 three dimensions, uh, fermionic lithium in two dimensions and, and see what happens there. Um, or simply put our fermions in 2D, um, that is exciting, that is interesting, um, um, whether we learn something uh, um, extremely new will be seen, but it's exciting, and I will talk about that a little bit. Uh, we could mediate P-wave interactions by sig sitting in a bath. Okay, so, so with fermions, two fermions sit in a bath of a Bose-Einstein condensate, the mediated interactions might be uh, 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 strong at the Feshbach resonances, they should be P-wave. And uh, well, that, that is exciting as well. That needs mixtures. And I will talk about that, um, uh, how to get those mixtures. And then, well, we have dipole interactions, for example, magnetic. Um, uh, there was a recent uh, uh, wonderful result on, on dysprosium, a Fermi gas of dysprosium. Uh, these magnetic interactions on the scale of E Fermi are unfortunately very weak. So, so it is hard to observe uh, strongly interacting Fermi gases where the interactions are dipolar. What, one ho what we, we hope to do is to engineer electric dipolar interactions. For that, we will need strong electric dipoles, so let's go to the fermionic, uh, the, uh, let's go to the ground state of a molecule that is fermionic, and then we can hope that these interactions are really strong even on the scale of E Fermi. And of course, we know about the wonderful work uh, by the Gila group, David Jin and Jun Hee on rubidium potassium. There was one issue that Unfortunately, chemistry is not switched off. So rubidium potassium and another rubidium potassium form rubidium 2 and potassium 2, and then it decays. So you have to put it in optical lattices and, and play harder. Let's see uh, what uh, we can hope to achieve in sodium potassium. So after this general motivation that we want to get Fermi gases with more complex interactions, let me uh, go to Flatland first, um, where I... Uh, uh, I, well, I want to show you a model of uh, uh, closely stacked superfluids. Uh, here we have a, a cartoon picture of a Fermi gas um, 
in a one-dimensional optical lattice, so we chop our 3D cloud into lots of pancakes, and, well, the cartoonist put lots of vortices in there that are beautifully bent a little bit. Um, this would be a model that is uh, a slight bit closer to what happens in real materials like high-TC superconductors, where you have layered structures most of the time. So here, for example, in these high-TC materials, you have copper oxide planes, and that's where all the action happens. That's where the strong interactions occur, and there's only weak coupling between the planes. And, well, of course, high-TC superconductors are very complicated, but maybe just to, to see what the dimensionality does to, to this pairing, we can go to this kind of situation and see whether that already enhances uh, pairing. Apart from this, of course, 2D Fermi gases are a paradigm of condensed matter physics. You need to understand what, what Fermi gases do in 2D, so it's, it's a wonderful field of, of study. Uh, how do we make these uh, pancakes? Well, it's, uh, it's a standard technique for cold atom experiments. We just confine the atoms tightly in one direction, um, so much that only the ground state is populated in the transverse, uh, tightly confined direction. So um, that is relatively easy in the lab. In fact, you can come uh, uh, have a look at it at the, over at MIT. Uh, we simply let to reflect the laser beam of a mirror, and that gives us a one-dimensional uh, lattice. The 2D-ness, so how strongly these pancakes are really confined in 2D and how strongly they're coupled to each other, because these are coupled pancakes, we can simply tune by the lattice steps. We have a rather deep lattice. The Fermi energy is just 10% uh, or so of the uh, harmonic oscillator spacing in the tight direction, so it's really a, uh, uh, can be made uh, a strongly 2D uh, world in which these fermions live. Um, the the first thing that we studied um, in the system is what happens, what's the fate of pairs. In 3D, we have wonderful pairing, uh, but only in the many-body system. Pairing requires uh, e either strong, inter uh, strong attraction for two particles in vacuum, or many-body physics, the Cooper pair. You need the presence of the Fermi C if you only have very weak interactions. In one dimensions, two particles in vacuum, if they just attract ever so slightly, they will form a pair. In two dimensions, it is kind of a critical story, but this, it's still true. Two particles for the weakest attraction, they do bind, but with the fluffiest of all bonds, it's really exponentially suppressed um, in the interaction strength. Uh, so, so it's interesting to see what happens then as you go from 3D to 2D to, to 1D. The pairing should become stronger. Uh, here's what happens in, um, uh, in this um, BECBCS crossover where you can tune the scattering length, A, um, and here uh, I compare the scattering length to the um, distance between the... Um, uh, to the harmonic oscillator ground state actually of this... Um, uh, ground state length of this tight uh, pancake. Um, this is in 3D world. We have no lattice depth at all. Um, so in two, um, for just two particles in vacuum, there is a threshold um, on the BEC side of the, uh, of the resonance. At, at, uh, at the fresh balance, you start forming the bound state, and then this bond uh, becomes stronger and stronger. But there is no bonding on the so-called BCS side, on the negative scattering length side of this um, Feschbach resonance. As we now increase the lattice depth and go to more and more kind of a 2D world, quasi 2D, this threshold for molecule formation shifts, and it shifts more, and it shifts more, and in the very deep lattice you would even get um, a bond at uh, the faintest interaction between two particles. Yeah. There is a prediction uh, right at the Feschbach resonance. There is no longer a length scale associated to, to the interaction strength. The scattering length has dropped out of the problem. So two particles sitting in these pancakes have to bind with some binding energy that must be a universal number times the harmonic oscillator spacing in this tight lattice. That's the only energy scale available. So it turns out that can be calculated to be 0.24. How do we probe these, these pairs? Well, uh, it's the usual R spectroscopy uh, uh, story. Um, we can, uh, without any interactions, we know, of course, very precisely what the uh, distance is between a spin-down atom and the third state um, that, that is empty initially. We know exactly that is, uh, um, uh, that is just the hyperfine and Zeeman interaction. But with some bond between spin-up and spin-down, you have to provide a binding energy before you can break the bond and put some blues into this third state here. So that's how you can measure the binding energy. Um, 
Now, what happens in, uh, in two dimensions? It turns out whether or not you are forming a, a, a bound state uh, can be simply recast as the question, what, what happens to the density of states? It turns out uh, in 3D, it grows a little bit too much. There is too much phase space for these particles to escape from each other. So there is no bound state in 3D for the weakest interaction. For 2D, the density of state is constant. That's just OK for them to form a bound state. And now, well, if you, if you look at the RS spectrum, you would expect uh, that, the, uh, that the spectrum should go like the uh, probability to find any of these uh, blues or reds uh, particles at a certain relative momentum k, where k is selected by the RF photon that you use, just energy conservation, times now the density of final states, you do have to look whether there is a final state available for this green particle to fly away. In 3D, this directly translates into a shape that looks like that. Just uh, uh, a threshold law squared of omega minus the binding energy divided by omega squared. The omega squared com comes from the wave function. In 2D, you would say, it's a constant density of state, so it should be just a theta function. I get nothing, 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 and then something once I have a frequency, RF frequency, larger than the binding energy, and again divided by omega squared. Now, in 2D, interactions always hit you. Interactions are never really switched off. Even for the weakest interactions, there's a terrible log, a logarithm, in front of the coupling constant. So turns out, for the spectrum, if you, if you are careful, you do get logarithmic corrections uh, just because the final state is slightly interacting. Looks horrible, but it's actually not so complicated. It's just proportion to the scattering cross-section of this green guy with another red guy in the final state. It's not so bad. So these are the spectra that we observe uh, as we go from a tight, from an, a no lattice to a tight lattice, from 3D to 2D. As you see, a pairing gap opens up, becomes very large, um, becomes on the order of the confinement energy scale. Here it's on the order of uh, 80 kilohertz. Well, sorry for experimental, that's awesome. <laughs> that's a strong bond at the Feschbach resonance just by switching on the lattice. Uh, you can look at the spectra themselves and try different fit functions. If you try the naive one without the final state interactions, it's terrible. If you try the correct one, including the log corrections, it looks perfect. Now you might say, well, but this, this naive one, you should smoothen it out first by some experimental broadening. Yes, sure, but still the uh, correct one looks much better. So this is actually, it's hard to see in 2D these effects of these logarithmic corrections. The, uh, um, uh, normally in, in the 2D scattering. But here you see it directly from the spectra. You can map out the binding energy as a function of this lattice depth, and it roughly follows the prediction from two-body theory, which is surprising. Uh, I should say, uh, if you just do mean field prediction, you put a BCS state uh, into these pancakes, which is a many-body state, you might think the binding energy is very, very different from the two-body binding energy. You might think, well, many body effects should really modify this, this bond, right? Somehow in 3D, we only get a bond because of many body interactions. So in 2D, there should also be an effect. But we do the mean field calculation, it comes out the bond, the energy of the Fermi, uh, fermions, the, how strongly they are, uh, they are uh, bound, is actually just given by the two body bound state energy in mean field. Now, of course, Winfield cannot be correct. So maybe we are not allowed to put all these binding energies here on a two-body graph. See, I only have two-body uh, constants here, the binding energy h bar omega. And here I have the, the scattering length and the harmonic oscillator uh, uh, length. Maybe we should put them on a many-body graph, where here I compare the binding energy that we measure to the two-body binding energy. Winfield would predict that this does not depend at all on the uh, a coupling strength here on the, on the density, essentially, this is a complicated way of saying uh, this is the ratio of the Fermi energy to the scattering length, right? Uh, so as I crank up my Fermi energy, does anything change? Well, both in the BC and the BCS regime, you expect that you should get the two-body result, but in the middle, it should be interesting. Turns out we don't see that a lot of stuff happens. I mean, we see something happen, for sure, but we don't see that a lot of stuff happens. Um, so I'm actually curious to find what uh, Stefano will uh, tell us about that curve <laughs> from Monte Carlo. Back to 3D, clearly. This is a 3D um, thing. Um, projected on a 2D screen. Um, back to 3D, another way 
to uh, engineer um, interesting uh, strong uh, interactions uh, would be uh, uh, going to mixtures. Mixtures give us a rich phase diagram. Both Fermi Fermi mixtures. I have. Uh, I want to see what can I do with all these these guys. If I have Fermi Fermi mixtures, uh, I could hope for fermionic superfluidity of unequal fermions. A wonderful story. Usually you have an electron and an ele electron pairing up, or a neutron and a neutron pairing up. Here we could have lithium or potassium lithium six and potassium forty two fermions pair up. Um, we can study imp uh, impurity physics, and if you look at the uh, title page of the program, this is exactly it. These are Fermi polarons uh, uh, revealed by RF spectroscopy. Uh, we can hope to pin one of these impurities in a, a 3D optical net so that it no longer moves, uh, and then uh, we might hope to engineer things like condo interactions of the uh, surrounding three-dimensional gas uh, and this impurity. Uh, an exciting um, prospect might be the observation of Bose polarons, where you are an impurity that swims in a Bose fluid, in a Bose gas, Bose, Bose Einstein condensate. Uh, um, so far, this has not been uh, uh, demonstrated uh, that you can actually have dressed particles swimming in a Bose gas, in a Bose Einstein condensate. They should be able to attain a very large effective mass because they can grab all kinds of bosons. There's no limit on how many. Whereas in the case of Fermi polarons, on average, you can at most grab one. Uh, one particle from the bath that makes you maybe on the order of like two times heavier than, than in the vacuum, but not much more. So that would be exciting to see. It would come much closer to the real polaron in, in, in solid state systems where you have an electron uh, propagating through, through a crystal lattice. Now, fermions in a Bose Einstein condensate. Um, they have another exciting prospect. If you put a fermion there and another fermion there, because the fermion, say, say it repels the bosons, well, then the second fermion sees that now there's less of a density of the bosons around this first fermion, and it loves to go there. That's an effective induced interaction, which is P wave in character. And it doesn't matter whether the fermions repel or the attract the bosons, you always get P wave. That would be wonderful to study. And so both Fermi mixtures are an interesting avenue. They allow us then also to uh, go to Fermi molecules. And those guys, if you go through the pain to do this, this wonderful stirrup process, you will hope to end up with a dipolar Fermi gas of ground state molecules. And then maybe the interactions are very strong and uh, new physics will emerge. Here's the rather crazy apparatus with which we uh, uh, hope to study these uh, uh, phases. We have uh, uh, two Zeeman slowers feeding us um, uh, potassium atoms or sodium atoms or lithium atoms into the main chamber. And we get a zoo of uh, magneto-optical traps. And I actually didn't have a picture of the sodium because we edited it so quickly. We never took a picture. We just got a condensate. Um, so, so that's, that's the, the uh, apparatus. Um, it allows us to uh, cool sympathetically a mixture of, for example, potassium-41, potassium-40, and lithium-6. So we use the boson, potassium-41 here, to cool two Fermi gases down to degeneracy. We have found fish patterns between all combinations, which is great. So that gives us a whole new zoo of both Fermi, Fermi, Fermi mixtures. Actually, it's not a new zoo of Fermi, Fermi mixtures. Those were seen, seen before. Um, we found a wide Feshbach resonance between the isotopic mixture of 41 and 40. That's exciting because 41 and 40, come on, for all purposes, they're pretty much twins. But there's a little neutron attached, which is more, uh, th th there's one more neutron for, for one guy. Suddenly, the quantum statistics changes. So here, you could hope to really just study the effects of quantum statistics. And you don't have to worry about things like different gravitational sag, etc. But well, in the remainder of this talk, this will be my topic, sodium, potassium. Uh, we threw in sodium. Why did we do this? Well, we knew it would be an efficient coolant for fermion lithium-6, and we were greedy. We just wanted more potassium. So we thought, like, how about cooling potassium-40 with sodium? Could work. We already knew there was a larger negative background scattering length predicted for sodium-potassium um, uh, mixture, so we thought, okay, the evaporation could be efficient to some point. As it turns out it's true. It's, it's, it's rather wonderful. Uh, also, a larger negative background scattering length uh, gives us usually hope for wide Feshbach resonances. The case of lithium-6 is very famous, where you have a very large and negative background scattering of minus 2,000 A0. 
you switch on a little bit of a coupling between a single molecular state and the incoming channel, and you get a 300 Gauss white Feschbach resonance, a, a gift of nature. Now, this mixture should then um, allow uh, studies of both Fermi mixtures, also in easily tunable species dependent optical lattices, because the two wavelengths for sodium and, and, uh, and, and potassium are, are far apart. Um, and well, here's, I would say, the, the thing that we should try uh, as soon as possible, ground state molecules, because they should be chemically stable in contrast to rubidium potassium. They should have a large dipole moment of 2.7 dB in contrast to rubidium potassium, which has 0.5 or so, which is respectable. But if you now calculate the dipole-dipole interaction energy for rubidium potassium, you get roughly a percent of the Fermi energy. For sodium potassium, because it goes like the square <coughs> of this guy here, um, it could be 30%. Yeah. So it could really be a Fermi gas with dominating dipolar interactions. So uh, this, these are the um, pictures that tell us that we have achieved quantum degeneracy between sodium and potassium. We can either load a little bit of sodium, then we get a tiny condensate and a healthy Fermi C of potassium 40, or we have more sodium, get a very nice condensate, and then what is that? <laughs> it's not a Bose-Einstein condensate of potassium 40. These guys are just sucked in to the condensate due to the strong negative background scattering length, which uh, provides a very nice attractive mean field to these fermions. By the way, we, we think um, that maybe if we, if we tune things right, this should be very good to, to have an efficient transfer into the molecular state because they're already sucked into the sodium, perfect, and now you sweep over the resonance and it's great. In reality, I must say that losses then are also totally enhanced and, and it's not uh, as, as good as, as you might think. Um, well, once you have a new mixture, you go and, and probe Feschbach resonances. So, so that's what we did. Uh, we went um, uh, actually not so far, <laughs> up to 200 Gauss or so, but we already found over 30 resonances and said that's probably enough for now. Um, it's, it's quite amazing. We have lots of P-wave uh, resonances. They're actually doublets and triplets. It's very interesting because they're very low field. I'll show a, a, a zoom in on, on that in, in one of the next slides. And we also have very broad S-wave resonances. This is 30 Gauss wide. Uh, how do we know what they, are, what they are, whether they're S-wave or P-wave? Well, it's actually um, uh, 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 quite nice if you take the um, a, a simple model. It's called the asymptotic bound state model, which is very, very powerful. And you just tune the unknown, which is the weakest bound state of your interatomic potential, both the triplet and the singlet, you don't know, a priori, you can, you can see what pattern of Feschbach resonances you, uh, you achieve. And actually, the, the uh, potentials were already so accurate that the Feschbach resonances here, they were predicted to be somewhere between zero and, and maybe 100 Gauss. So it was already quite clear where they should be. And now, uh, to, to actually get also this very broad one here, uh, you have to modify this bound state model to include this strong negative scattering uh, length. That is just exactly the same thing that we did to, to model lithium-6. I mean, people like the community. There's a wonderful paper by Matzelis and Kockelmann that are on, on how to include this negative background scattering length. And then see what happens to the molecular state. It wants to cross here, but no, there's a strong coupling to the open channel, which is the black line, and the resonance occurs far away from the original uncoupled crossing point. That is That must be uh, um, a Feschbach resonance that creates open channel dominated uh, uh, molecules. Here's a zoom in. It's a wonderful <coughs> quadratic looking uh, bound state energy as a function of magnetic field. Um, 30 Gauss Y turns out and, and uh, is, is just a, a, a bliss. Um, here's the scattering length. It tunes wonderfully at this broad Feschbach resonance. Um, I already said that we found uh, interesting uh, P-wave structures, P-wave multiplets. Uh, these are at very low fields. We have some actually at five Gauss. At those fields, um, uh, if, you, if you just uh, uh, look at, the, um, at what these dipole-dipole interactions could do bet between the, the two spins of the two electrons that are now trapped in this P-wave molecule, uh, the usual intuition says, oh, they can either go around this way or around this way, uh, with respect to the magnetic field axis, but that would mean they always have the same interaction, both repulsive, doesn't matter which way they go. So that should give one and only one resonance. And then there's this resonance here, where they actually 
sometimes are attractive, sometimes are repulsive, and it should slightly give it slightly different energy. That should give a shifted period of resonance. So it should give two. It should give a doublet. Where it's such low fields that actually this dipole interaction can couple to molecular states of different MF. Yeah? So there's um, more than just this, this, this guy, this guy, and this guy. And also we have low fields, so it's not correct to say that they're all aligned with the, with the magnetic field. So we can actually see uh, uh, distinct PWF uh, Feshbar resonance. And now from a practical point of view, that simply means we can make uh, one kind of PWF molecules only, instead of having, for example, uh, the right and the left rotating guys in your trap. This is the zoo of, of Feshbach resonances. Uh, there are broad ones in each of the possible, uh, in each of these studied um, hyperfine combinations of sodium in the ground state and potassium in the lowest, second to lowest, third to lowest, etc. Um, even the lowest ground state gives us a four Gauss wide resonance, which is nice, but we love this guy here, 36. Well, uh, these days we know it's, it's 30. Um, so we, we, sh we, we zoomed in on, on this one to now create Feshbach molecules. Uh, the, uh, a nice way to, to create molecules is to go into uh, a hyperfine state which is not resonant at that field. Um, it's, a, it's a common technique that we, we love to use for, for all, all these mixtures. We go uh, uh, with an innocent hyperfine state, creep up to the Feshbach resonance, which is not there in that hyperfine state, and then we drive a radio frequency transition, shabam, into the strongly interacting uh, system. And here, well, if there's a bound molecular state, we should see a second uh, resonance, not only this feature here, which is just the uh, atomic transition, by the way, with an interesting tail due to the repulsive mean field in this final state, but also a second little hump here coming from molecules. In fact, you can just uh, uh, fit this with, uh, with a simple model which says, well, I roughly have uh, uh, some distribution of sodium, some distribution of potassium, here, I took the max and bolts because that gave a nice analytic result, but it's probably not quite right. Um, so a bit degenerate. Um, there's a frank common overlap between the two free atoms and the molecule, and then you have to conserve energy. So if you, oops, uh, if you do that, you get this uh, uh, little fit curve in the, in the background, uh, which, which tells us also that this initial gas was quite cold. Like it cannot have been uh, uh, much hotter than 100 nanokelvin, otherwise this this width would not work out. Um, we can also dissociate these uh, uh, molecules. Uh, once you make them, you want to see that uh, you, you really have them. <laughs> they are real. Uh, so we dissociate them, and we see uh, the same binding energy um, as we measured for the association, now going to yet another hyperfine state for the dissociation process. Yeah. Uh, what about the temperature? Well. Um, uh, imagine you start with this Fermi gas of, um, of potassium-40 and you have some Bose gas. It's not condensed. We don't like it to be condensed. Too many losses is terrible. Um, and now you want to associate these guys. Um, at, at, uh, at zero temperature, <laughs> all would be good. You had a, would have a condensate, a Fermi gas of potassium-40. You would get a zero temperature Fermi gas of molecules. Uh, wonderful. But um, this is not what happens uh, here. We have, we have finite temperature. And then uh, you don't preserve temperature, of course, in this RF drive. You, you preserve, so to speak, the, the phase space for the, the pair uh, 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 center of mass momentum. And well, if you measure then the kinetic energy of our molecules, it's on the order of 250 nanokelvin. Um, and the original Fermi energy is on the order of 200 nanokelvin. Uh, from sodium, we know that the temperature is on the order of 80 nanokelvin. So we are dominated by simply the, the, the distribution of the, the fermions. This could still mean that we are borderline degenerate with this uh, uh, molecular mixture. However, of course, it's not thermalized. So, so one cannot really call it a uh, degenerate gas. Um, here is uh, the lifetime curve, which tells you why I cannot call it the degenerate gas. Uh, without removing the atoms, uh, for example, the sodium atoms are the worst. Uh, we get like a four millisecond lifetime, which is OK. But if you push out the sodium atoms, which we can do because they feel a weaker potential than the, than the uh, molecules, uh, then we get a uh, nicer uh, lifetime on the order of 10 milliseconds. Uh, um, please note these are not molecules formed from two ground state hyperfine states. This is the third to lowest hyperfine state. So you might expect there should still be 
uh, uh, spin relaxation losses going on. Um, so it's actually rather respectable considering that. Um, uh, the ground set rubidium molecules made from ground set atoms were also on the order of 10 milliseconds, unless you, you actually remove them by making ground set molecules first. And <laughs> coming back, um, um, so so it's it's respectable. Maybe in the in the absolute ground set we would see longer lifetimes. Uh, now maybe the final slide here is the binding energy versus magnetic field. That's what you want to show. Uh, you, you, you produce molecules at, in a wide range of uh, energies and magnetic fields. Look at the, the x-axis here. This is really uh, the tens of Gauss. This is the scattering length coming directly out of our measurements. Um, uh, it's a wonderful, uh, respectable Feschbach resonance. So now, um, uh, outlook, what would be the strategy to go to ground state molecules? We know a hell of a lot about sodium potassium, I figured out, actually. Uh, before the rubidium potassium work, it was the most well studied uh, um, by alkali molecule. So um, we know the ground states extremely well. Uh, turns out for potassium 39, but that's easy mass scaling. Um, we know the excited states fairly well, and we know lots of transitions that, that have been observed in 39 potassium and sodium mixtures. And for example, one transition here to this to this. Uh, uh, singlet state, B1 singlet state, that is strongly coupled to a triplet state, so you get fluorescence on both lines, which tells me, okay, so singlet triplet mixing is there and is efficient. So it should work to, to do this stir up. Outlook, well, uh, sodium potassium ground state molecules would be stable against chemical reactions. The dipole moment is huge. Stir up should preserve the entropy for article fresh bar sample <laughs> if, if you do an, as good a job as, as uh, the guys at Gila. Um, so that would bring us towards a stable, strongly dipolar Fermi gas with an interaction energy of 30% of the Fermi energy. And then I really want to know what will go on. So thanks for your attention. Here's the group. And yeah, thanks. <laughs> Most of these guys are in the audience if you want to know, know more. Sebastian, Cheng Soon, I'm not sure where Peter is. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, questions, please? Carlos, please. Uh, Mari, hi. Uh, for, for the sodium uh, potassium mixture that you have, you, 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 I, I can see your, your goal. Uh, uh, of course, it seems that you're not going to have any issues, or presumably you're not going to have any issues uh, regarding the chemical reactions. But um, uh, would you, if you were interested in looking not only uh, ground state molecules, but you know ground states and excited states, so I can consider like a, a pseudo spin kind of thing, are there any issues known already for sodium potassium as far as collisions and 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 and. and not that I know of, but uh, uh, I, I know the lifetime of uh, higher vibrational states. Of course, it's, 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 it's not terrible, but as you go very high up, it becomes weak again. I, I guess the, the, from the ground state to the first excited state should give us still uh, um, some lifetime that we can work with for, for interesting uh, things. I, I don't know much about uh, the, the properties of this first uh, first excited state, for example, so I, I cannot yeah. say. I think in rubidium potassium, there are issues, so it's sort of out of the picture for having the pseudo. Mm -hmm. uh, One issue is maybe the hyperfine interaction is very small, so you have to be very, very good at like hitting the right, like just one guy, and so uh, technical issues for sure. Yeah. Further questions? Um, Martin, uh, what happens if you, let's say, come from the uh, negative side of the Feshbach resonance and sweep the magnetic field uh, slowly across the resonance. Do you lose, uh, uh, do you have big loss uh, uh, rates? Or? Well, so it turns out this is the, the, the first thing we tried. Um, the, there's a technical problem. If you have very small numbers of atoms and you sweep, okay, you measure your atom number. Now you repeat the experiment by sweeping and sweeping back. You measure the atom number, uh, and now you want to take the ratio and see, you know, oh, did I lose a lot? You have to have very stable, a very, very stable machine, very, very stable atom numbers. It has to be perfect to actually see something within the noise. So we were a bit lazy, 
and said like, okay, let's just associate these guys. Then we have two hyperfine states to look at. The incoming, the, the initial channel, the final channel, you can take the ratio of those two and uh, get a wonderful signal of the ratio, which is stable to um, some extent um, uh, against atom number fluctuations. So for a technical reason, we immediately went, well, well uh, quite immediately went to the association uh, uh, method and um, we saw the molecules improve the machine. Now we should probably go back, try all these things, sweeping, you know. Yeah. It's gotten much more stable. OK, thank you. Hi. Uh, as, you, as you said, uh, polarons have been looked at in uh, fermions, uh, but not in bosons yet, at least experimentally. Are there some problems experimentally, or...? I hope not. <laughs> uh, okay. Not, not anything really that you can foresee. I hope it's just going to work. <laughs> so one thing that's going to work for sure is that you just do this inverse RS spectroscopy. Just as I uh, showed, um, as we go into the molecular state, we also go into the uh, repulsive uh, state of two, two atoms re repelling each other. Um, and we, we already see the mean field, which is, by the way, a very observable uh, shift. It's quite amazing. Once you put a condensate there, whoosh, yeah. imagine what it will do. So it's going to be beautiful to, to do this inverse iris spectroscopy, for which we don't have to worry about lifetimes. On the other hand, then you do couple to all excited states of the problem. Um, so so uh, it's maybe a bit hard <coughs> from the theory side of things to, to back out what's going on. Now, we do have a lifetime of 10 milliseconds, even of the molecules at 100 kilohertz. That's, for me, really respectable. So maybe we can hope to make the stuff in the strongly directing system, have it there for long enough so that it roughly equilibrates, at least locally, and then do the real iris spectroscopy into the free state. Maybe we can really probe something closer to the ground state. Yeah, It would be wonderful. Okay, further questions? Jessica? Maybe I have just a curiosity. So uh, if, uh, if I rem remember correctly, in the case of potassium rubidium, the lifetime of flashback molecule were they found a dependence on the scattering lens. Mm -hmm. Have you uh, looked into this or can you? We haven't yet. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we, we probably should. It's, it's very interesting, it's, it's, uh, it's nice. They did a wonderful study uh, already on, on the dependence on the scattering length. Um, but who knows, it's a different mixture, different properties. Uh, maybe, maybe it's a bit different. We have a broader Feshbach resonance, a more open channel dominated. We might hope to see more universal uh, dependencies on scattering length. Yeah. yeah, that would be very nice. Yeah. OK. Any further questions? Matteo? Uh, sorry, just uh, a curiosity, it's, uh, and I re-ask what you were explaining about these P-wave resonances. Uh, uh, can you repeat the, uh, the your explanation it's, about it's this tough. triplet? It's tough. So it turns out, this is, I mean... Now, because we see exactly the same thing, okay. and I'm not sure about... Okay, so so uh, I think we, we figured it out. So this dapple dapple interaction um, thingy, um, that uh, that can create uh, up to <coughs> delta m f equals two transitions because it's a it's a w you can you can win in the uh, spin and get get some angular momentum Th those can be traded for each other and um, so it, it can it can change the uh, m f uh, the total spin projection um, by by uh, at most two usually that doesn't happen um, if you're aligned in magnetic field you only uh, have these um, uh, ML it's plus minus one kind of states, etc. But uh, well, at, at low fields, there's still there's still a zoo of other Feshbach resonances with different MF, so other, other molecular states with different MF around, close enough, so that you can actually couple to them, and that causes shifts. Once you couple to one of these guys with a different MF, which differs by one or two, you, you get a shift of your own state, and uh, with that, we could actually uh, roughly reproduce the patterns that we see. Yeah. Wait a second. Could it, could it be D-Wave? Well, we, we know the potential sufficiently well that we can just nail it down. It's like, it's P-Wave. <laughs> it's, it's, it's nailed down by the, by the potentials. Um, once you have the S-Wave state, you can, you can figure out what the, what the uh, P-Wave ground state would be, what the D-Wave state would be, etc. Turns out the D-Wave state um, is for most of the fields here actually uh, 
uh, only quasi bound. It's hiding behind the centrifugal barrier, but it's not uh, it's not there um, as a real state. Yeah. So it's P wave. Okay, if there are no further urgent questions, I think we should move on in the program. Let's thank Martin again. Thank you. Thank you.